Hi, everyone, and thank you for taking a work break with us and joining today's webinar. Um, I'm going to give it just a couple of seconds for people to get logged in and uh, start coming in. And while we're waiting for people to get settled, uh, feel free as you come in to go ahead and switch uh, your chat panel to all attendees and panelists. That way that everybody can see any great information that you want to share during this webinar. Uh, we will listen to Professor Michael Segrew's thoughts on Moliere's The Misanthrope today. So welcome to that. This is one of the neoclassic comedies with wit compared to Oscar Wilde and Jane Austen. The Misanthrope brings to light reflections on human nature and the moral economy of the court. White lies make social life possible and sincerity has its limits. Once again, as people get settled, we'd love to hear from you where you're from, where you're joining us, um, and as well, make sure you change that uh, chat panel from all attendees and panelists, from all panelists, excuse me, all panelists to all attendees and panelists. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about the misanthrope, and we'd love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. So today, I do have that great pleasure of again welcoming Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. Uh, Dr. Segrew is a professor of history at Ave Maria University, a graduate of the Great Books program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in, the, in history from Columbia University. Prior to taking his position at Ave Maria University, Professor Segrew taught at Princeton University, Columbia University, Johns Hopkins University, and many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm a global marketing specialist here at Biblioteca, and behind the scenes we have my colleague Kelly Knutson helping to make sure everything is running smoothly. We will be sharing the chat log with all attendees after the webinar, so make sure you do switch that setting uh, to attendees and panelists. If you have specific questions, please use the Q&A panel. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top that you want the professor to answer. Uh, and so those will be featured more at prominently and we'll be able to answer them more quickly. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about the neoclassical comedy, The Misanthrope, and would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. Now with that, um, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. We've recorded his lecture previously, uh, but Dr. Segrew will join us at the end live to take questions. Here's the misanthrope is one of the greatest achievement of French letters. And uh, it's also one of the funniest plays ever written. Uh, there's something in human nature which either doesn't change or changes so slowly at such a glacial pace that we can still find 300 year old jokes funny and Moliere is nothing if not uh, talented delicate and uh, above all humorous He's one of the great comic writers of the Western tradition and uh, he wrote for a royal audience and since he had the king the queen and aristocrats and various kinds of noblemen in the audience um, he had to be very careful how he handled delicate topics, all right? If you want to stay in royal favor, it's important to be careful what you say and who you say it to. Yeah, at a place like Versailles, where there's nothing but backbiting and uh, kind of internecine complexity and, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, artfulness, uh, it behooves someone who's not a king and not, or not an aristocrat to be very careful how he handles himself. Now, well, one of the things that's great about the misanthrope is that it's actually a meta comedy. What I mean by that is that it's a comedy about comedy. The idea here is that um, he is considering what the best way of writing comedy is, and for him, that's not just a, just a theoretical problem, right? Um, it's there, the two traditions in comedy that I'm thinking of and that Moliere was thinking of is the tradition of Roman satire. There's 
a tradition that comes from Horace, and there's a tradition that comes from Juvenal. Horatian satire is mild and good-natured and gentle. It's the kind of thing you get from, say, Erasmus in, uh, in Praise and Folly. We're all stupid, we're all sinful, and we're all uh, worshipers of folly in a way. On the other hand, uh, the Juvenalian satire is harsh and bitter. That's the kind of thing you get from Jonathan Swift, where he flogs and lashes out in mean-spirited satire, which is actually very funny, uh, like, say, uh, A Modest Proposal. Right, so Swift is a very harsh juvenilian uh, humorist. Erasmus was a, a mild Horatian humor humorist, and Moliere knows both traditions, and he's asking himself, which would be better? Which is the true comedy? Which is the right understanding of comedy? And this is important for him because, in a Catholic society like 17th century France. The justification of drama, or particularly comedy, was that it held vice up to ridicule. So it had a good effect on public morals. And there's something to this. Uh, people can, can cope with being criticized, but almost nobody can cope with being laughed at. So ridicule is actually a very powerful way of influencing public sentiment. Uh, think of the influence, for example, that uh, late night comedians have on American politics, right? So uh, humor can actually go a long way in talking about the human condition. Now, the juvenile and harsh kind of satire is tempting because we'd all like to flog the people and things we don't like. They all deserve a good beating. And it's really kind of an ego trip to lash out at them. The problem here is that the juvenile comedian or critic, he's setting himself up on a pedestal superior to everyone else. He's in a position to judge them and he finds them all guilty. The Horatian poet, the Horatian comedian says, look, we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. We're stupid and sinful and folly reigns just about everywhere. Uh, on the other hand, we shouldn't be uh, smug about our folly either. Granted, we can't entirely avoid it, but we should be well aware of it. Well, it's more fun to be a juvenile. It's a little bit more influential to be a Horatian. The reason why is this. Um, whenever a harsh juvenile critic like Swift writes a harsh satire, people love it and they read it and they laugh at it, but nobody thinks he's talking about them. Everybody thinks he's talking about somebody else. On the other hand, uh, and so it doesn't do much good. On the other hand, um, in the Horatian satire, what we get is the sense that it's not especially accusatory, it's not mean-spirited, and we're all in the same boat. People actually identify with that because the Horatian co comedian is not setting himself up as superior. He's one of us. Now, Moliere has to decide which he wants to be. And he has to consider the politesse necessary in court life. In other words, um, Versailles is not a good place to be sincere, right? Um, you can't say what you think. In fact, everything is carefully measured and weighed and gauged, and uh, nothing is what it appears. So Moliere decides to write about politics, to write about the white lies we have to tell in order to make society possible. And he does this by identifying two kinds of hero, and they come in at the beginning of the play. There's the misanthrope, whose name is Alces, and he's the title character of the play. There's also his friend, who's Philon, and he's trying to persuade his friend to be more reasonable and more flexible. Now, Philon did not get his name accidentally. It is connected to philanthropy and philanthropic as opposed to misanthropic. So these two comic heroes represent the two kinds of comedy. The harsh juvenile comedy is Alceste, the misanthrope, 
he flogs everyone but himself. And the good natured Horatian comedian who understands human frailty, that's his friend Philon, the philanthropic comedian. Now, we go through a wonderfully dizzying plot about uh, pride and about honesty. And it turns out that unmitigated honesty, honesty without self-censorship, is what you get from children and idiots and the misanthrope. And children say things that may be true that their parents wish that they had not. And the misanthrope says things that are true, and he sort of likes the idea of being ornery and cantankerous. He takes this to be a symbol of his great virtue, but he is on a, a considerable ego trip. And we will find later on that he needs to be lied to just as much as everybody else. If everyone told everyone the truth constantly, it's hard to know if there would be half a dozen friends in the world. So uh, you have to have a little delicacy, a little tact, and that's what the Horatian kind of comedy is about. Now, you have to remember that Moliere is one of the most famous men of letters of his day. And that meant, since he was at court, that aristocrats were constantly coming him, to him and asking if he would read their poetry and tell them and, and let them know honestly if Moliere thought their poetry was extraordinarily wonderful or terrifically great. And pretty much that's all you can say to an aristocrat. You don't dare say, please, you're making a fool of yourself. It's an embarrassment. You don't need to write this to make money. Leave it alone. Which is what uh, Alceste said right, in the play itself. So Moliere knows that it's necessary for him to lie to these aristocrats about the quality of their verse. And he wants to talk about it in a Horatian way. So he has Phila and Alceste talking to each other about the need for white lies when Orant, an aristocrat, comes and reads some poetry to them. And Phila says, oh, that's wonderful poetry. Why? Because he's a Horatian, mild satirist. And this is the kind of mild satire. On the other hand, Alcest tells the truth. He says, this is terrible poetry. You should never write poetry again. You're an idiot. Or, you know, you're, 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 a, you're no poet at all. And so Iran takes offense. Iran says he's going to prosecute him for uh, slander. And he's going to take him to court and ruin him, which he does. Now, thereafter, Philon says, well, what was the point of that? How did it help you to tell the guy what you were really thinking? Now, you have to remember, this is being played at court before the king and a whole collection of aristocrats. Perhaps 20 or 30 percent of them had been to Moliere's quarters where they asked his honest opinion of their poetry. So the audience is full of people and that, who have been behaving like Orant, and their friends are nudging them in the ribs saying, he's talking about you, you idiot. Your poetry is awful. So this is actually a, a Horatian send-up of the poetry he's getting. And it's his explanation for why he's not a juvenile satirist, because he wouldn't last very long at court. And so understanding the subtext here, that he's talking directly to the people in the audience about their conduct, is actually a wonderful, complex reflection on what's going on. Now, we need a love interest. It turns out that Selimen, a little flirt, uh, who leads lots of men on, uh, is the object of Alceste's affection. And this is funny because she's nothing like Alceste. And this shows an interesting human foible People often fall in love with the wrong people, and they are not, often not good judges of what love does to them and their thinking. Uh, Selimen is in some ways the inverse of Alceste. Why does he love her? Because that's the way love is sometimes. It can be perverse. Uh, Elion, the... Uh, 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 an admirer of Alcest says he's very uh, severe, but I admire his virtue. And uh, he eventually rejects her 
and she marries instead Elam. Now remember that com that tragedies end in death, but comedies end in marriage. And the reason why is because comedies are about the first half of human life and tragedies are about the second. So comedy, because it ends in marriage, identifies in this case the true comic hero who is Philon, because he's the one that actually gets married at the end of the play. Alceste is unable to get married because Solomon refuses to join him, leaving society to live in a cave which is what you would have to do if you were going to give up the politesse and white lies that make social life possible at Versailles. Now, in the middle of the play, Act Three is one of the most noteworthy and hilarious and beautifully bitchy dialogue or pieces of dialogue in the Western tradition. It is clever and sharp and witty. Uh, I might compare it to something like Oscar Wilde or Jane Austen at her very best. Very quick dialogue between Selimen, our young coquette, and an old washed up croquette, or coquette, who has uh, become something of a scold and a prude now that men no longer desire her. She finds Alceste very attractive, but he honestly tells her that he finds her deeply unattractive. And she is always minding other people's business. So there is a wonderful back and forth where Selimen and Arsinoe, who's the, which is the old scold's name, in the most delicate kind of way, beat each other up while claiming to be friendly. So Arsinoe, the scold, the old, the old lady who's become rather prudish, she says, dear, I want to tell you, not my own opinion, but opinions I've heard people say, expressing that you are of very loose morals and that they strongly suspect that the reason so many men hang around you is because you are um, not a, a morally upright woman. Now, I, of course, told them that was wrong, but there are so many people saying it, and it is becoming a scandal, so I wanted to make this clear to you because I'm your friend. And Salomon understands this perfectly. It's a cat fight. So she comes back and says, Arsinoe, oh, thank you very much for this help. I wanted to mention to you that a lot of people have been saying that when pretty women grow old and ugly and no longer get the attention of men, their envy drives them to become prudish and, uh, well, interested in other people's affairs to an unhealthy extent. Uh, now, I don't, of course, think that about you. But there are people who think that you have an unhealthy interest in my sex life, that you should stay out of other people's business, and that you're a wretched old crone. They go back and forth for what must be five or ten minutes of the sharpest repartee in French letters. It's wonderful. Now, one of the funny things about Moliere, he himself was a comic individual, um, not just a comedian. Um, he and his, his, his wife was part of the, his comic troupe. But so was his mistress. And I have a suspicion, I don't know it for a fact, but I have a suspicion that this uh, repartee is drawn from, from life with his <laughs> older wife reprimanding the younger mistress and the younger mistress giving it back just as well. It's a really nasty uh, exchange and it's wonderfully fun to read. And remember, Moliere is writing in verse. <coughs> And everything sounds better in French. So uh, if you can read it in French, certainly do so. But if you can't, um, try Richard Wilbur's translation, where he manages to put it into English first. And uh, finally, the play ends with Solomon being revealed as a flirt and all her bows withdrawing from her. At one point, Alceste becomes so desperate that he actually asks her, please, lie to me. Tell me that you love me. Because he needs to be lied to just as much as everybody else. And finally, he decides, since he's lost his law case and he is too honest for civilization, he's going to go live in a cave. And he offers Solomon the chance to come with him. She declines because she says she doesn't want to leave society. And the last line 
gives away the significance of the argument about comedy. The last line is, we must go and help this unfortunate man. And Philon and Elion, who are now married, who are getting married, uh, Philon is the true comic hero here. It means that Alceste, the misanthrope, is not the real comic hero, that the juvenilian comedy is the second best comedy because the Horatian comedy that Moliere has just produced has been devastatingly effective. And now what he's going to do is hold vice up to ridicule. And the vice he's holding up to ridicule is the misanthropy of juvenilian comedy. So it's a beautiful package. Um, it, in some ways, is a lovely confection, like a, a beautiful, ornate piece of French cake that's almost too beautiful to eat. And this is, I mean, I think the long suit of French culture, their uh, belles lettres are always uh, first rate, and there's a whole galaxy of writers. But as far as I can tell, Moliere is the greatest comedian in the French tradition, and this is the best work that he did. Thank you so much. I was just finding my mute in my video. Uh, thank you for joining me, uh, Michael. I appreciate you being here live with us. Uh, great lecture. Uh, I've had the privilege of now listening to it for a couple of, you know, two or three times, and I always hear new things, which I love. I do too. <laughs> um, for those of you who uh, joined us, make sure that as we go through, you type those questions into the Q&A box. We'd love to hear from you, love to hear what you're curious about, about Moliere, about the uh, misanthrope, or even just French uh, plays and uh, literature that would include of that time period. So I'm going to move over to the Q&A panel right now uh, to see who I saw a couple come in near the end of the lecture. So we'll start with some of those. Dr. Segru, have you ever seen the film adaptation of The Misanthrope done by uh, Ingmar Bergman? And no. if so, wondering what you thought. Oh, <laughs> no, I haven't. Thank you so much. It had never occurred to me, but <coughs> um, I would love to look that up. Um, I owe you a beer. <laughs> Thank you very much for alerting me to that. I had no idea that Bergman had done such a film. There you go. I, I, I would assume that that would probably be a 1940s, 1950s rendition uh, if guess, Bergman's yeah. in it. Yeah. Uh, another question that has come in is, given how snarky Moliere could be and was, in The Misanthrope, how much trouble did he get in with Fr the French court and King Louis XIV? Well, actually, I, as far as I know, this wasn't the, the play that caused him the most problems. No. The play that caused him the problem was Tartuffe, because there he attacked uh, pseudo-religiosity and uh, there was a scheming clergyman or pseudo-clergyman, but the church took it very badly and uh, they uh, refused to allow it to be produced. And they asked the king and successfully to uh, censor Moliere about that. Now, with regard to the misanthrope, um, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that he got in any more trouble than uh, he could handle because of the gentleness of the criticism. Remember that he's always able to say to any individual aristocrat, look, I was talking about a fair number of guys, and you know who they are, who are dabbling in, in letters, but you and I know each other to be at the top rank in terms of literary judgment. So you can always flatter your way back and the aristocrat may or may not recognize that, depending on whether he has a kind of, uh, whether he's using his head or not. Uh, but um, the work is done for anybody with smarts. They realize, look, he's saying, he has to tell you how great it is. And even more, it must have brought a lot of delight to the guys who are sitting next to the would-be poets, digging them in the ribs, saying, I told you your poetry was awful. All right, but you told me Moliere told you it was great. <laughs> and that's why. I mean, it's such a beautiful, elegant, oblique way of communicating the truth. And that shows the strength of the Horatian tradition. It is possible by checking your pride at the door 
and treating yourself just like anybody else to criticize in a way that people accept because they know it's true. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, a follow-up question that I had um, that I had written to that's similar to that, but the misanthrope came about midway in Moliere's career. It came in 66, um, 1666 to you know, <laughs> put the full date on there. Uh, he had already written a number of well-accepted works uh, for both the court and his playhouse, including the famous Tartuffe, which he did get into probably more trouble than he did, and the school for wives. Do you believe that by the time he wrote the misanthrope, Tartuffe, I believe, came like only like two or three years before the misanthrope did, if I remember my history, uh, was he beginning to want to put out, point out more falsities in the court, or was well, this always uh, an undercurrent of his plays? Yes, there's certainly a sense that uh, society is conventional and that these conventions are necessary. And, uh, you know, white lies are a, a fact of human life, except, you know, for children and idiots. And, uh, and people who, are, who have lost a sense of proportion. See, the problem with Alceste is not that the honesty that he values is a bad thing. It's that you have to have some judgment about how to deploy your honesty. And although, uh, he detests dishonesty, like everybody else, he, he succumbs to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, my guess is that he's wanting to get into the good graces of the court, and so he's not going to produce anything that's religiously oriented by the time we get to the misanthrope. The misanthrope, though, is a permanently funny idea. Uh, notice that tragedy is about individual people. Uh, it's about Hamlet or Othello. We can't say uh, that Hamlet is about the indecisive Oedipal young man. No, it's about a particular guy. Same sort of thing with Oedipus. Oedipus isn't the incestuous uh, guy who blinded himself and you know, in, <laughs> wrecked his life. No, uh, he's a specific person. Now look at the titles of Moliere's great comedies. The Misanthrope, all right? Uh, the imaginary invalid, all right? These are permanently funny things, but the key thing is here, these are types of people. These are not individuals. In other words, saving up money and pinching every penny so that you can be ultimately the richest guy in the cemetery, that's an intrinsically funny idea because it's intrinsically stupid. It shares that permanent funny quality with Aristophanes. And his jokes are even many centuries older, but they're still funny too, right? Uh, the same sort of thing that we find in all the types that Moliere gives us, that's characteristic of comedy. So uh, the misanthrope or the hypochondriac, the imaginary invalid, hypochondria is funny. When people think they're sick but aren't, that actually can be played all day and all night. And Moliere hit right on it. And uh, he has a, what I would call perfect pitch for comedy. Uh, that's why they're still funny, at least for me. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here. Of, do any Moliere's original scripts survive? Like from I don't know about the, the manuscript. I don't know about the manuscript tradition. All right. Okay. I assume because they were prominent and he was very successful that it was probably quite continuous. Right. Well, I mean, we're in the in the 1660s and 70s. Um, we're, we're pretty well established that playwriting is not uh, is genuine literary art and not a, a base form of art, as yeah. sometimes argued by the Puritans. Um, and then you mentioned going off of that one, since we're talking about the original scripts, but you had mentioned um, the Richard Wilbur translation. Obviously, that's an English translation. The original French and Moliere and most of the, the um, adaptations since then in French are still the rhyming couplets. Richard Wilbur um, does have the rhyming couplets as best as he could with that translation. But do you know of any other translators who did the rhyming couplets or did they do more of just a straight translation for, uh, for Moliere's yeah, text? Uh, I think Wilbur is the, is the one who comes closest to holding on to the French poetry. Okay. Now, if you have, the, I mean, since this is an audience of librarians, <laughs> uh, who I'm sure you are linguistically capable, if you have the French, read it in the French. It's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
it, it, it's like a beautiful piece of French cake. I mean, it's too beautiful to even eat. Look at the damn thing. And uh, if you don't have the French, you get a sense of what it's like from Wilbur. And that's really wonderful too. Uh, I don't know of any better translation. I wouldn't want to translate Moliere literally. Show a little of the tact that Moliere himself is arguing for, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you want to treat Moliere literally, um, and without uh, a certain amount of, uh, I don't know, how can I put it, uh, mm, emotion into your translation, uh, I think you're going to miss what's vigorous in Moliere and what's still alive in him. Um, I do know, and, and I don't have the talent of reading or writing French. I took Spanish in high school, and that is rudimentary at the moment anyway. Um, but I do remember my sister coming uh, back from her French classes in both high school and college, and Moliere was an assignment um, in French, I would say two probably at that point. But And this goes back to kind of the conversation we were having before we started today, because Moliere is just so um, digestible and readable for, for even uh, his... Uh, time period of writing, you know, it, it was very digestible. And so they, it is still assigned to French classes, whether they're theater or not, as a way to understand French and, and get the witticism and, and start learning French poetry. It, it, that's all true. Uh, I, I, I have yet to meet the person um, that does not like Moliere once I you know, give, give them a copy of The Misanthrope. I say, look, read this. I mean, look, even my children, who I can't get to read, <laughs> they like Moliere. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's saying something. Uh, I hope that this is an audience that likes books. And if you do, um, it's a wonderful hour, hour and a half read. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you will laugh out loud because it's so well done. And uh, it's such an exquisite little gem that... Uh, it's always a favorite of the students that I've taught for 40 years. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had a case in which somebody didn't like this or where they found this onerous reading. And so uh, give it a shot. Um, and then before we get off of the translation, Mark, we're going to test your knowledge here as well. Uh, someone has asked if there is a good Spanish translation that you know of, of Moliere. You got me. That I do not know, ma'am. Okay, just, I was like, like I said, testing your knowledge there. How, how far in depth do you have on Moliere? All right, continuing on with some of the questions that have popped up. How would you compare the Moliere comedies to the Shakespearean comedies in terms of Juvenalian and or Horatian type humor? Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I think that Shakespeare is a, uh, is a stronger playwright, more important playwright than Moliere. And it hurts me to say that because I mean no uh, denigration of Moliere. There are very few things that I enjoy or appreciate more than his work. If I had to talk about Shakespearean comedy, I would say there's a great deal of uh, variance, variation in uh, Shakespearean comedy. And uh, if you look at his early primitive comedy, like Comedy of Errors, um, that doesn't meet Moliere's standard. On the other hand, the later comedies, for example, uh, Measure for Measure or The Tempest, I think those are among the greatest comedies ever written. So uh, I think there's a considerable amount of development in Shakespeare's treatment of comedy. On the other hand, if you look at the central part of his career, the middle part, when he's kicking out the five big uh, tragedies, right? I mean, one after another, what an extraordinary achievement. Uh, you know, people have sometimes thought that, you know, he lost his son around this time and uh, that was connected with his move to tragedy. But although I'm sure he had deep grief, um, if I wrote a tragedy as good as King Lear or Romeo and Juliet, I'd be on top of the world. So I don't know that he was actually unhappy, although an experience with grief, I think, is necessary to understand tragedy. Wonderful. And that's, yeah, that's what, tragedy is for old people. Uh, <laughs> comedy is for young people. Fair enough. Um, and we have another question here. Moliere captures the silliness of people in general. It seems like the misanthrope uh, could be about almost any social group. Uh, college soror sororities and fraternities, corporations, the White House. Was it his goal to write uh, an un uh, universally accept or applicable work? 
Yes, that's exactly the idea. In other words, in choosing between Horace and Juvenal, when he says, look, Horatian, gentle, good-natured, inclusive satire or inclusive comedy is the right route to go because one, it's effective in changing the world, changing people, but two, it's genuinely funny if you do it right. Now, granted, it's easy to get big laughs if you're going to flog everybody. It's not easy to get big laughs, which this play is full of, if you're gently pointing out the foibles of the audience, right? Mm -hmm. You have to imagine all those people who are thinking, oh, God, I did bring my sonnets to him. And uh, how powerfully effective that must have been, because no one can take offense, because he can plausibly say to anyone, of course, I don't mean you. And of course, that just proves his point. And uh, in that sense, he's trying to write a universal comedy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, universal com. think of it this way. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to persuade us that tragedy is philosophically deep. And in fact, it is, or it can be. Um, less attention has been paid to comedy, but I think that comedy is at least as important and I think that comedy can be cognitive. Now, not all comedy is, of course, slapstick and, you know, the, the Three Stooges. That's not the cognitive comedy I'm talking about. But something like Moliere is actually telling us something. You're learning something about human nature in The Misanthrope. And uh, you're also learning something about human nature in uh, both Measure for Measure and The Tempest, mm -hmm. right? Prospero is behind everything but, and in control of everything, but you would never guess that from the perspective of the characters. You know, it's a final gesture, you know, at, uh, at the ongoing life that Shakespeare, you know, has now bypassed. I mean, by then he's at the end of his career and at the end of his life. Uh, my argument would be that comedy is deeper than people think, and that doesn't prevent it from being funny. Um, I, I, I completely agree with you, especially in my, my history of uh, working with comedy and tragedy. Tragedy tends to be very in-depth and, and more attuned, but, you know, and you can break it apart and there's definitely layers there, but comedy tends, especially in a good comedy, um, whether it is a recent one written for the movies or back in Shakespeare and Moliere's days, uh, there are definitely, or even back to the ancient Greeks, there are definitely layers in those comedies that you can find. I wanted to kind of go in a little bit deeper dive with you since um, I'm still waiting for a couple more audience questions. So I, I feel guilty pleasure here. It is my question that I'm asking here. Uh, but the part of the genius of the misanthrope was Moliere's combination of the Juvenalian and Horatian satiric styles. Like he has both styles in there, which you don't normally get as much in, in various plays. With the way the play ends with the marriage of Philon, uh, the more Horatian character, do you think that Moliere then supports more of that Horatian style of comedy, the, the white lies, the kindness, the falseness in court, even as a person, as well as a playwright, over, over the harsher criticism of human nature um, and juvenilian style? So basically a longstanding theater tradition, this is kind of a layered question, I apologize. <laughs> the longstanding theater tradition tends to be to put more of the uncomfortable make your audience uncomfortable in front of, you know, like so that to help them see the heightened reflection of themselves so that they can learn it. So was Moliere more Horatian and wanting to walk on eggshells or did he want to see a combination of both to reflect how people can learn in different ways? This was um, Moliere's uh, tour de force. You're right, he can do both Horatian and uh, Juvenalian satire. Um, but it's the difference between, say, nuclear warfare and conventional warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, Moliere decided not to nuke any of the aristocrats because he knew what the result would be. Instead, he has Alceste be a kind of nuclear comedy, and the problem is, is that this isolates itself from society, and that's not what comedy does. Remember that comedy characteristically ends in marriage. Mm -hmm. This is because the comic hero, who is a type of person, not an individual generally, is being reintegrated back into society through marriage, okay? In tragedy, in which the hero is not a type but an individual, like, say, Othello, 
what is being what's happening is it's being separated and individuated from out of society with death so um that's part of why you have the different kinds of hero and the different kinds of ending in comedy and tragedy now moliere is showing by dropping a, a, a nuclear bomb on an uninhabited island he said by the way ladies and gentlemen of the court if i wanted to fry any one of you all right i would have done it the problem is i would have been fried next so this is my way of showing in the person of Alceste what I could do in terms of laying every one of you down. But because I value my head as well as I value yours, I've decided to go with Horace. And if I do it right, because I'm such a great comedian, you will understand exactly the point I'm making without me being in any way uh, caustic or abrasive like a juvenilian. So if I get results, good results with the Horatian, then I don't want to make people too uncomfortable. I just want to make them cognizant of what the real state of affairs is. He does so, but in the, in the gentlest and funniest possible way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, it, it's something that after listening to your lectures and, and, and going about it, I started thinking about it more and more. We have another question here is Moliere references his own works a number of times in this play. The other example that comes to mind is his reference uh, to his own work, School for Husbands, which was one of his earlier works. If I remember School for correctly. Wives, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was this common in Moliere's time, or was this more a point to emphasize a point, thought, et cetera, to the court or the audience of his plays because it would be a recognizable title? Well, there's a continuity in Moliere. And um, it's not just a continuity in the comedies. He also produced ballets mm -hmm. and a number of other theater pieces. So he's a, a very competent and very shrewd operator. He gives the court and the better class of people in Paris, the ones that have the money, um, what they want. So he's very attuned to that. Uh, the school for wives or the school for husbands is a, a great theme from comedy that sustained comedy for many more centuries than, than the three or four that are separating us from Moliere. Think of Lysistrata with Aristophanes. Mm -hmm. The women go on a sex strike. That's an intrinsically funny idea. If I tell my 18-year-old freshman uh, about this play now, they will all smile and laugh slightly because it's still funny. Well, the same thing is true about the school for husbands and the school for wives. Um, people often are lacking self-knowledge in Shakespeare and quite correctly, I mean, in some ways, that's the big theme that holds the, the, all the plays together. But in Moliere, it's kind of assumed that people have a limited self-knowledge, which is kind of what you would expect from a wry comedian. And he says, not only don't you know yourselves, you also don't know your husbands or your wives. So uh, our lack of knowledge and our uh, unintentional opposition and conflict um, is the matter for comedy. And it, it's actually a still a live topic. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think there are any great tragedies left to be written. And the reason why is that we don't have kings and generals and people sufficiently elevated to meet Aristotle's standard. But I think there are still great comedies yet to be written because we're all stupid and refuse to learn. <laughs> and we all make mistakes even though we know better. And when you're honest about it, each of us is as dumb as everybody else. So that's why I think that there are still great comedies yet to be created. I love hearing that. I love comedies. Um, okay. We did get a question in saying, is there a current playwright or even a, a movie maker, director, storyteller that you can think of who is our current Moliere? Okay. Um, uh, before he became uh, really deep, I thought Woody Allen was very funny. Uh, the, 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 uh, when he started to get all existential and black and white film, uh, that just was trying. But uh, his early stuff, and I'm thinking particularly of, my, of what I think is his best work, it's called Broadway Danny Rose. And what he's specifically trying to do is create moral artwork. And if you look at the 
<laughs> the dopey guy that, uh, that is the uh, hero, um, he is still a man of considerable compassion. And uh, it's why uh, Broadway Danny Rose gets his own sandwich at the, at the uh, Carnegie Deli. So uh, yeah, I would see Woody Allen at one time. Uh, who else is a great comic uh, movie maker? Hmm. Can't think of any that come to mind. Fair enough. Um, kind of going on that, are there any more of Moliere's works that you see the same witticism, reflectiveness on society and depth that we can recommend our audience? Oh, yeah, reading? absolutely. Um, if you get a chance and you liked, uh, the, uh, and you like the misanthrope, go to the imaginary invalid. That's a rip. Hypochondria is funny. Now, art and life kind of connect here, uh, because that would, uh, the imaginary invalid was Moliere's last work. It was being performed at court. And, uh, while he was playing it, uh, he was the imaginary invalid, of course. Um, he had a heart attack. So he began, he turned all red and his eyes bugged out and he began ripping at his, uh, shirt and he hit the ground or lurched around the room and uh, nobody knew what to do. But I believe, I, was, I believe the audience thought it was actually pretty funny, so they clapped. And then they dropped the curtain and two hours later he was dead. Now, uh, I don't know if he went mourned or unmourned given that his, both his wife and his mistress were probably on stage with him. But uh, we lost a great wit when he died and this was God's way in a way of saying, aha, I can go you one better. You think you're a comedian? I'll turn your life into a comedy and everyone will clap while you die in a play about hypochondria. <laughs> I mean, you can't do it any better than that. I, I don't, I, after studying theater my whole life, I don't know if I actually ever heard that story. That's amazing. That's how he goes. Horrible for him, but, but still a, an amazing uh, anecdote. Yeah, I mean, um, you see where comedy comes from. So I have a, a fairly weighted question uh, here, and it, it is a little bit long-winded, so, so bear with me. When I knew we would be doing this, I had to pull out my old co copy of the play and reread it. I think you and I chatted about that a little bit. With mm -hmm. today's struggles, and, and I know we have an international audience for the most part, but this is probably going to be a little bit more U.S. heavy oriented. Uh, but with today's struggles and the politics going on, especially in the United States, a line spoken by Fallant near the beginning of the play really did strike me, which probably didn't the last time I read it, which was 15, 20 years ago. Um, and wise men accept their times without objection. And there's no greater folly, if you ask me, than trying to reform society. Now, do you believe Moliere truly believed that? Or was it more of a reflection that mankind changes, but that they change so slow, especially on a personal level? And what, if anything, can this play written in 1666 still teach us today about how we should or should not act and should or should not change in today's society? Well, um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, let's see if we can take it apart. Yeah. Uh, I think that Moliere, given that he's writing in, at the French court or in Paris in 1666, at the height of French uh, absolutism, I think that not only Moliere, but that anybody who wants to keep his head on his shoulders is going to uh, vociferously express the belief that reforming society is a very, very bad idea. Up until 1789, that was not a good thing to advocate in France. Right. I mean, you might advocate a change, you know, a, a change in morals, like uh, say Rousseau did in the first in discourse, uh, the discourse on the arts and sciences. But uh, if you're at court suggesting that we should go on uh, social reform, uh, you know, activities um, would be completely out of place. Um, it's because it really has would have no historical roots and historical sources. In other words, uh, reform is considerably easy in a democratic regime that has a written constitution that has actual, you know, a, a process set up to create amendments. But the French absolutist regime was not set up to be amended. It's a relic of the Middle Ages. So um, I think that uh, it would be honestly, 
suicidal and stupid, remember he's Molière as a family as well, to uh, say, uh, you know, he, he wants to, to, ar um, to argue against monarchy or some such thing as that. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not concerned with the moral improvement of the world. It's just that you accept the fact that you're not going to be able to perfect it. That's the Horatian view, because we look, each of us is part of the problem, right? The idea that everybody else is the problem isolates us and makes us incapable of community. So I think that uh, one of the important things about Moliere's comedy here is that the real comic hero gets married and goes back into the human community, right? So you get reintegrated. Think of it this way. Comedy is about revocable mistakes. In other words, mistakes you can fix, right? Like, uh, for example, Eliane's initial infatuation with Alceste. She sees later on that she's better off with uh, Philanth, and she's willing to take second best. Why? Because that's actually better for her, all right? Uh, so uh, comedy is about revocable mistakes. Tragedy is the opposite. It's about mistakes you can't fix, all right? Once at the end of Romeo and Juliet, once Juliet is dead, there's really nothing else for uh, Romeo to do but pick the rest of the poison, all right? So uh, comedy and tragedy in that respect are about uh, what can be fixed and what can't in human life. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two final questions from, from audience members here. Recently, uh, one is more of a comment, but I want to get your take on it. Recently, I heard Dave Chappelle's stand-up comedies compared to Moliere for today's young people. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I really think he's funny. I think he's a terrific comedian. Uh, I think he's very talented, and uh, I don't think he pulls punches. Uh, I also think that he's smart enough to be able to know how to be both... I don't think he'd use these terms, but I think he's smart enough to know how to deploy juvenile and how to deploy a Horace or that kind of satire and when it works and when it doesn't. In other words, it's a little bit like, uh, I don't know, touch in a musician. If you have touch, um, that can be more important than any technical ability. And I think that both Moliere and Dave Chappelle have touch when it comes to comedy. Wonderful. And the final question that we'll leave it with is, um, what is your short list of essential comedies to read? Oh, boy. Oh. All right, let's try Lysistrata, uh, The Wasps, by, and The Clouds by Aristophanes. Uh, I guess anything by Plautus, because they're so similar. They're, they're very structured and very stylized. Uh, for Roman comedy. Uh, there's not a lot of funny stuff in the Middle Ages, uh, but I would go to uh, Shakespearean comedy. Let's see, uh, Measure for Measure, uh, The Tempest, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, let's see what else. Absolutely have to have Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest, right? Uh, the dandyism is just gorgeous. You know, and, and he's, he's more than polished. It's just lovely. And uh, I might say also uh, hmm, comedies. Uh, 20th century comedies. Well, how about Dr. Strangelove? Mm -hmm. All right. That's as dark as comedies get. Uh, and Kubrick is a great comedian when he wants to be. Great. So thank you so much for uh, this great conversation, Michael. We do really do appreciate it. We love getting a deeper dive into Moliere's comedy and the misanthrope and just hearing your view on everything. Uh, we do currently have one more reflection break scheduled and three more to be announced uh, with Dr. Sagru in our Classics Revisited series. So keep an eye out on that. Uh, we will be discussing the history of the Peloponnesian War next week by Thucydides. I always make that mistake right there on the 22nd. Additionally, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, Biblioteca is continually adding to our virtual event lineup, always driven to, by engaging library leaders and what libraries around the world want to hear about. Please visit biblioteca.com forward slash events to register to join us. If any of the dates and times do not work for you, just remember they are always recorded and on demand for viewing, so keep checking back at the website.
And then finally, as we finish today, we would love for everybody to complete a quick survey to see how you enjoyed our work break with the classics. If you have any questions, leave them in the follow up survey that will pop up as you log off. And with that, from everyone at Biblioteca, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Michael, again, for leading today's discussion. Thank you.